Well, welcome to the Ripon Community Church. My name is Aaron DeMaster, and I'm officially a guest speaker here at RCC. For those that don't know me, uh, I was a pastor here at RCC for almost 10 years. I was the youth and outreach pastor, but have been in the process of launching Centerpoint Church in Fond du Lac, and we're beginning services in September, uh, September 13th. Our services, they'll be held at the Children's Museum in Fond du Lac, which is an amazing space. Uh, our whole, the whole goal of launching a church in Fond du Lac is to help reach people who are not connected to a church, which is 40% of Fond du Lac. And a large percentage of that is young families. So what better place to be in than a place that's specifically for kids and young families? Although this is not the dream time to launch a church, right? Coronavirus, mass, quarantine life. Yet I believe that when God called me to plant a church, he knew that this was part of the process. Our team of over 60 adults, we believe that although it's not the textbook time to plant the church, people still need a church, community, and they need connection with God more than ever. We will be a community set to provide community for those who need it during this time and after. The pillars of our church are positivity, realness, and relevancy. So if you know anybody in the Fond du Lac area, could you tell them about Centerpoint Church for me? We are looking for both Christians who will help make our church happen and our mission happen, people that are willing to serve and volunteer these last few weeks and the few months in our, into our launch, along with people that you know that need a church, are looking for a church, or maybe need God. If you could even bring them to a service this fall, that would be an amazing gift to me and to Centerpoint. All right, shifting from my selfless church promotion, uh, today we're, kicking, or we're continuing a series that we've been calling Doubt, which, whew, doubt is something I can relate to significantly. I'm a pastor here, and, but I will tell you one thing. I'm sure I've doubted just as much as many of you have, if not substantially more. Let me give you some examples of how I've doubted. Uh, I wrestled with significant doubts in the Bible and interpretations of it. I remember hunting Google, like scourging Google for answers, artifacts, remains, or anything I could find to find certainty on God. I needed certainty and answers. I want to guarantee you. I grew up in the church, and I remember hearing about this guy who's known as Doubting Thomas. is kind of like his nickname. He's in the Bible, and he was one of Jesus' disciples. And what happened is Thomas actually, like when Jesus came back from the dead, he needed to stick his fingers in Jesus' wounds. And I'm like, when I heard that, that's my guy. Like, that's the guy I want to learn from. That's the guy I want to connect with. I want to be like him and put my fingers in wounds because I doubt things. I, my doubt continued on into my early young adult life where I knew, I know this is wrong, wrong as a Christian, but I used to test God to relieve some of my doubts. Like, I'd put myself in the positions where I would, like, want God to intervene. I used to beg for vision or some sort of audible comment or noise from God. And then finally, when I was at the pinnacle of my doubt and was about to let it consume me and just let go of my faith, I had a complete mind shift and approach to faith. And what summarizes that shift in faith for me is this quote that you can't have faith without doubt. And then at that moment, I realized that Jesus' teachings, they really provided life-changing experiences when you humble your desires, which was humility for me, right? My desires of certainty. And I allowed that to be okay of letting go of certainty. And by acting on what I did know, which is exactly what so many people in the Bible did that you read about. And that is something I still live by today. With all of that said, I hope my rawness of struggling with, with doubt is something you can relate with. Have you wrestled with doubt like I have? Have you searched or struggled or begged for answers yet still doubted? Are you at the pinnacle of your doubt holding on to faith by just a, a thread? I think we've all doubted at times and doubt at times, and it's okay. Today, we're going to talk about how when you choose faith, even with uncertainty, it has a return of an experience with God and a certainty of Jesus' character. 
Today, you're going to leave seeing how the choice of faith changed everything for some people in the Bible and the practical steps they had to take to experience that, that connection with God. My hope is these steps will be something that encourages you to have faith and to hold on to it if you're just at, about to lose it. So let's get to it. I'm excited to talk about this story with you. The first story is one with Jesus and a woman, and it's in Luke 7. And it starts with Jesus going to this dinner party hosted by Simon. And Simon is a Pharisee, which means he was a religious leader at that time. So Jesus is at this dinner party. He's invited. He's probably having a lot of fun at this dinner party. Well, this woman finds out about this party that's happening. She finds out that this, this party's going on and that this Jesus character, this person who's been performing miracles and does kind of some crazy, unique things and maybe could even help people, she shows up at this dinner party. And what she does is, as she shows up, I'm imagining she beelines to Jesus. She beelines to Jesus and instantly she starts crying. She starts crying and she gets on her hands and knees and she starts using her hair, much longer than mine, and she starts rubbing Jesus' feet with her hair to clean his feet. And then she takes a bottle of Chanel or, I mean, perfume, and she pulls out this perfume and she dumps it on Jesus' feet. Well, can you imagine if you were the dinner party host at that time? You'd be doing one of these, like, What's going on? Who is this person? Why is she here? Well, it actually says his response of what this host says. It's in Luke 7, 39. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus calls him out and he asks him, if two different debts, one large and one small, are both forgiven, who do you think would be more grateful? And the man says, well, obviously the one with a large debt. And Jesus says, and so that is with this woman. She washed his feet with her tears and Simon didn't even get him water. He calls him out like, bro, you didn't even get me a glass of water. No, not really. Actually, it was, you didn't even bring me water to wash my feet, which was a ritual cleansing back then. So this woman did this act, which was an amazing act in that moment. Now, it's kind of an intense story, but how it ends is, is Jesus says to this woman, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's powerful. There's so many details in this story that I can't wait to share with you that really enrich it. But I also see there are a number of things that we can do to be like this woman, to overcome our doubt and to have faith save us. The first is, is a very obvious one. And one I want to address immediately, it's look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. She went towards him instead of pulling away. She saw him as a possible answer to her doubt, her brokenness, her hurt, to her mistakes, to her next step. So she looked to him. Now, this seems obvious, but honestly, how often when we're doubting God, or when we're not really feeling real Jesus-y, or we're struggling in our faith, do we decide to pull away instead of go to God? I'm a guest speaker, like I said, here at RCC, so I'm going to kind of call RCC out for a second here. So many times I was here as a pastor, I'd hear, I'm doubting. I'm messing up. I don't fit. I'm not as action-oriented as everyone else. I'm not sure God knows what's, what's best for me to do with my, my boyfriend or my girlfriend or my workplace or my family or my situation. Oh yeah, I'm going there. I'm doubting him, essentially, is what you're saying. So then we'd pull away. And I'd hear so many times, I'm not going to go to church now. I'm pulling away. I, I need to work on myself. I need to figure things out on my own. That's so wrong. The church is a place to help you grow in your faith and make those decisions and figure out those decisions, not to be a place you feel you can't go because of something you chose or did. 
the woman in the story, I mean, she obviously doubted God's ways, right? If your sins are many, you've obviously chosen, I believe I know what's best for my life, not God. But to defeat her doubt, to wrestle with it well, she goes to Jesus or to a place that she can see and experience and be with him. Have you done that? Are you wrestling, disagreeing, or having a hard time understanding with something? Are you pulling away or are you going to Jesus? Going to him could, could be by having a personal relationship with him, which is basically being in prayer with him and reading scripture and connecting with him as much as you possibly can. Or that could be pushing into the church, leaning into the church for direction and guidance. If that's you and this feels like something that you need to do, I'm going to challenge you to rekindle your relationship with God and commit to the church to help you wrestle with your doubt. Do that in your head and your heart right now. Make that commitment to God. Or maybe it's to the church. Contact the pastor you're closest to and say, I want help getting past this doubt, this thing I'm struggling with. There's, there's another story in the Bible, and it's in the book of Mark. And what happens is there's this man who is a God follower, but he's doubting God's plan for his son because his son is very sick. Well, Jesus is around, and Jesus has been performing miracles, and, and Jesus is about to potentially heal this man's son. And Jesus essentially asks, like, do you think I can heal this, your son, for you? And in Mark 9, 24, it says this, The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Have you cried that out before? Or even asked that of Jesus? Help me overcome my unbelief, my doubts. That's what a relationship with Jesus and a church is. It's believing there's more than you in this journey and in this life and partnering with other believers to help each other with our unbelief. So that's our first point. The second thing is a little lighter, but it has to do with a few of these videos. Check it out. So these are my favorite ugly crying gifts. Actually, I couldn't find my favorite ugly crying gifts. So if you're watching online right now, you should post your a gif or a, a meme that you think relates to ugly crying. I'd love to see those because I couldn't find the one I was looking for. So post that in the comments. I'd love to see what you have. Uh, but the second thing in this story that moved this woman from doubt to faith was her brokenness or what I want to call a God experience. This woman, she was crying. She was crying, she's wiping feet, and she's using her hair to clean them. I mean, I'm not one to judge, but you got to be pretty broken to be doing that, right? you got to be pretty broken. Feet are nasty. Feet are so gross. But public brokenness and crying... Science says it does a couple things for us. It says crying actually gets support from others. Like how often have you seen someone crying and instantly feel for that other person? Science says that's, that's normal. That's something that does happen. And then it also says crying helps relieve pain. It's self-soothing. It's, it's shedding emotional tears and it releases uh, oxytocin and endorphins. And these chemicals, what they do is they, they make people feel good and they may also ease physical and emotional pain. So crying, it can reduce pain and promote a sense of well-being. This girl was going to Jesus broken, and in doing that, she was already easing her pain. I've realized, or I'm going to be honest with you, faith is hard until you've been broken. Faith is hard until you've been broken. I've realized brokenness, it happens to every single one of us, one way or another. I thought I was invincible to this, actually, that uh, I wouldn't have to deal with something like this, but I was so wrong. For those that maybe have heard, like, kind of some of my story with my family in the last month or two, we had a house fire. It actually was, like, it happened right after I spoke here at RCC uh, last time, 
and it kind of shook my world. We had a house fire, and it's kind of a long story, but we had a house fire and just a lot going on in the summer. Planting a church, house fire, baby, all kinds of different things. Well, about two weeks after the fire, I, uh, I'm working, trying to make this church happen, and then I'm also trying to get things set so that our house can be repaired and we can get back into it. And uh, the person that's kind of helping us with that, I was just talking with him, and he calls me uh, just a minute or two later after I leave the house, and he's like, Aaron, you got to get back here. You got a mess. I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah, there was a fire at our house. And he's like, no, like, obviously, yeah, I'm working on that, but no, back here, you got a, a giant tree down. It ripped your power line off. It, everything's, got, all the power's out. I'm surprised it didn't start another fire. I flipped. I was in my car, and I remember just pounding on my steering wheel. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I can't believe this is happening. God, seriously? Are you kidding me right now? I'm like, I'll be, I'll be there. <laughs> I hung up. And then again, I, I cry out. I'm like, God, seriously? Seriously? I was broken. I was broken in that moment, and I called out. I yelled, why must this happen? How about you? For you, have you done that in your brokenness? Have you gone to God in your brokenness? For you, is your God experience, is it a time when you don't understand? Is it a time that you're maybe experiencing loss or you can't fix something or you have to change or you're suffering? When we are broken and go to God, he has to show up then in some way. Sometimes it's in our thoughts. Sometimes it's the words that, like, that come to us. Sometimes it's through other people. Don't get me wrong. Our God experience can be in other things besides brokenness, right? It can come in joy and in blessing. But when you're wrestling with doubt, which is what we're talking about today, you are usually broken. Which goes to our next thing that we see this woman do. She is humble. She has humility. She humbles herself and her situation to God. If you want to move forward from doubt to faith, you got to let it go. This woman, she wipes Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair. Like I said, that's pretty humbling for her to non-verbally say to this guy, I think you've got what I'm looking for. I've done so much wrong that I'm willing to wipe your feet with my hair. But to be honest, God waits for this response all the time all the time. He waits for his people to be humbled before he responds, before he shows up. You can see this countless times in the Bible, like that one in Mark that I was just talking about where the father and the son, the father cries out, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. And then his son's healed. There's a time where this man has a disease and what God tells him is, you need to go wash yourself 10 times in the water. And 10 times, what, what's the difference? But he had to go and wash himself multiple times. There's a time where Abraham's got to go and, and sacrifice his son. And as he's about to sacrifice his son, and God's like, no, you don't have to do that. It's when you humble yourself is when God shows up and big things happen. It's on and on in Scripture. I find myself personally closest to God when I humble myself. But this is embarrassing as a pastor. It's not my first inclination. To humble myself. I'm personally, uh, uh, I'm an idea guy. I have lots of ideas, and as a church planter, I want to reach unchurched people. So I specifically am always thinking of unique ways to connect with people, always different ideas. I even go to the point, and this is something we say at Center Point, is we will do anything besides sin to try and reach people. Well, some of my ideas have completely flopped. Some have worked. Some have completely flopped. The one, like one that comes to mind that I remember is ice cream after school. Freeze your brain with Jesus was a saying. That didn't work. Uh, shot glasses. Give us a shot and it's got our logo on it. Uh, succulents. We don't suck. Check us out. Or poop eggs. We don't stink for, do for dog poop. Come and check us out. We don't stink. Some work and some completely flop. 
And then I find myself humbling myself before God. God, I guess I should have checked with you on this one first. It's a lot of times what I say. <laughs> but when you realize your doubt or struggle, do you humble yourself to God? For you, is it just this nonverbal or verbal statement out loud or in your head that you're saying to God? Is it an action to show God that? Is it asking for help or is it accepting the loss and moving forward from it? In our story, the woman not only cried and washed Jesus' feet, she also dumped perfume on them. And this was the gesture of it all. This gesture is the last thing I want to talk about today. This woman did something to move her doubt. She sacrificed. She sacrificed. And it's an active sacrifice. And this act of giving up this perfume bottle, dumping it, is more and even greater than what meets the eye. You need to know some context in this. Scholars, what, they believe that since it says this woman's sins are many and that she carried perfume, she was most likely a prostitute. Perfume was marketing. It was a way people knew it was her business. So when she shows up at this house and dumps perfume on Jesus' feet, she is saying, I doubt my decisions in the past were, were bad. Uh, I, I doubt what I did was, uh, and I believe that those things were wrong. I doubt what my present is, what you want me to be doing. I, I, and I have faith that you are going to change me so much that I will not need this in the future. Her act of dumping her perfume was an active sacrifice to moving forward from her doubts, from living on her own choices in the past, present, and future, and then accepting that this person, Jesus, will make it all right. For you, what does it look like for you to do that, to dump your perfume out? Is it trusting that God will get you through your situation and looking to him for direction on it? Is it choosing the God-honorable way instead of what you feel is most profitable for you? Is it realigning your priorities or letting go of complete understanding but giving it over to God to what you feel is right? Let's be real. What is the doubt you are struggling with today? Is it whether God is real or not? Is it whether church is important or not? Or is it whether it's important to give to church or not? Is it whether you should be vocal or about an opinion or not? Is it whether God is in this or not? Is it whether God could heal your marriage, your financial situation, your relationship with your kids, or a sickness you're dealing with? It? What is it? When this woman does this active sacrifice, her sins are not only forgiven and her life has been changed, but Jesus says her faith has saved her. That's amazing. Have you done that in your situation? As you wrestle with doubt, which again is completely normal, what can you do to be more fully faithful and to move forward with faith versus doubt? Is it looking to Jesus? Is it having a God experience and using your brokenness? Is it going with humility? Or is it finally having an active sacrifice? This week, I challenge you to look at your personal doubts and wrestle with them and either go to Jesus or the church with them and then expect an experience with God as you do that. And be humble, and then be ready to sacrifice. I'm going to pray that we do that this week. If you want to pray that with me, you can do that right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we just talked about dealing with doubt. And God, I just pray that you have us move forward from doubt so that we can continue to follow you and continue to have this connection with you. God, we, we want to wrestle with our doubt and, and not pull away from it from you in that time, but, but go towards you because we know that you can help us get through that doubt. You use different things to help us get through that doubt. 
So God, I pray that you challenge us to, to wrestle with our doubt and move forward with it so that we can continue to be a follower of you. In your name we pray. Amen. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says that God loves a cheerful giver. And you need to know that when you give here at RCC, you're not only honoring God with your finances, but you're supporting the mission and ministries of this church. And there's a couple different ways you can give. You can give online. You can go to rccsunday.com. There's a giving platform on there that's super easy to use, super user-friendly. You just click on the icon and you can give using a credit card or a bank statement. You can set up a reoccurring gift or just do it once, uh, one time. And another thing you can do is a lot of people like to give uh, by f giving a physical check in an envelope. If you want to do that too, that's totally fine. Our address is 155 State Street. We have a little mail slot on one of the doors that you can put it in. Uh, it's the door that's on the lower level that faces State Street, Fond du Lac Street, uh, and that's what you can do too. So I uh, love you guys. Can't wait to see you soon. Um, have a great week. See you next Sunday.